Good evening and welcome to ongoing election coverage from Town Meeting Television. Tonight we're covering the Burlington Central District and we'll be joined by candidates Tiki Archambault, Independent, also Perry Freeman, the incumbent Progressive, and Peggy Lures, also an Independent, vying for a City Council seat in Burlington. This is one of many of the forums we're doing in advance of local town elections on Town Meeting Day, which of course is the first Tuesday in March, that's March the 2nd from uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. if you're voting in person. You should be hopefully reaching out to your town clerk now and coming up with a, a plan to vote and be engaged for Town Meeting Day. Town Meeting Day Television is your opportunity to learn about the candidates and issues that you'll see on the ballot when you get there in March. If you're watching this live, we welcome your questions at 802-862-3966. Again, that's 802-862-3966. Please note that when you do ask questions that we'll uh, frame those questions to each of the candidates. Each candidate will get a chance to respond to it. And remember that throughout um, the election season and in lead up to Town Meeting Day, you can watch Town Meeting TV on Comcast via channel 1087, Burlington Telecom, channel 17 and 217, and also Town Meeting TV's YouTube page. So for tonight's forum, candidates will be allowed one minute um, to provide an opening statement where the general question will be, please tell us why you're running and what would be different from Burlington if you are elected. As we go through questions, and it looks like we have a, a, a large list of call-in questions and we'll go to those mostly first, but candidates will have two minutes to respond to each question and we'll rotate who answers first, starting first with the incumbent in terms of who will answer first. Each candidate will also be given an opportunity to ask um, a question for, of other candidates if our time allows. If a candidate's addressed during a answer, um, they'll have 30 seconds for rebuttal and candidates will also hopefully have 30 seconds available for closing comments. And tonight we'll, we'll use two time cards, one to indicate that there's 15 seconds left in the answer period and one to indicate that time is up and please stop and we'll try to give everybody equal airtime. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back towards the candidates and we're gonna start with opening statements and um, we'll start with you incumbent, Perry Freeman. Thank you, Seth. Uh, yep, so my name is Perry Freeman. I'm the city councilor for the Central District. Um, you know, one of my main goals uh, as a city councilor and getting involved in local politics was to um, really make uh, city governance and, and our you know, local spaces as inclusive and equitable as possible. Um, it's important that people who have been historically marginalized and vulnerable in our community um, are at the center of policymaking. That's something I've really strived for. Um, you know, largely I've um, passed policy around um, the climate emergency was something I worked on. I also was helpful in crafting the reparations task force, which is now underway. Um, and I was also um, very much involved in um, the uh, work towards building an, a new oversight for police discipline and have um, also focused sort of on general policing issues um, as well. And you know, going forward, issues around livable wages uh, will be something that I wanna focus on, you know, continuing to mitigate the climate crisis, um, as well as thinking about solutions for you know, how to make um, Burlington truly affordable. So I really appreciate your time tonight. And um, yeah, thank you. Great, next up we'll um, welcome an opening statement from Tiki. Thank you very much. So my name is Tiki Arshambo. I live on Crombie Street in the Old North End. I have been here 20 years. Uh, it landed here after traveling in search of the best place to live, right? And just found Burlington really felt like home to me. And when all the events lined up after we got here, it just made a lot of sense that, you know, we knew we made the right decision. <clears throat> really contented and active throughout all those years, doing a lot of uh, neighborhood things started the Crombie Street Fest, which turned into the Old North End Ramble, uh, been on CDBG grant boards. You know, I'm currently on the uh, Public Works Commission, been on it for nine years, three of which I chaired. So, uh, you know, try to stay active. I, I think rather contented all these years, except now uh, just feeling like I have enough concerns that it's worth uh, throwing my hat and just wanna give people another choice in this race here and um, try to, Try to strive towards a Burlington that just feels like a Burlington that uh, you know uh, our neighborhoods have come to enjoy. So, thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Tiki. Now we'll move to Peggy Lures. I'm Peggy Lures, and I my 
will work for my neighbors, not for a party. And I will work for a sustainable community as and truly low income housing. And I also am um, extremely concerned about our city being prepared for the future and the built environment. I've been a builder. I have uh, graduate studies in ecological design, and ecological economics, and I don't see enough attention being paid to that because uh, this is our future and we're not meeting it. We're, we're you know, the, the current mayor is kind of repeating, uh, you know, it's gotten us into developments that are all about developers, which is, and I think we need uh, to serve the community more. I spent 10 years in City Hall being the director of the Burlington Women's Council. We were named as one of the reasons for the Livable City Award for the city. And I helped get uh, do a lot of work for women in the trades and get that started. Get, it was Step Up for Women. It's now Vermont Works for Women, but that was all started with the Women's Council in conjunction with the Community Economic Development Office. And I know some of the poorest people in our city are women, particularly single moms. So I would still um, like to see programming that helps out women in those situations. I um, support racial justice and I support demilitarizing our police. Okay. Thank you, Peggy. Thanks to candidates for staying on time. As we said, we have a very active phone line today. Lots of um, folks interested in this race. So we'll turn right to the phone lines and Aiden in studio. Do we have our first question? Okay. Hi, I'm Betsy Allen Pottenbaker. I'm. Are you, can, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I am calling with a question for the candidates. Um, Perry, you have a prominent video on your campaign Facebook page that shows you chanting, all police have got to go while you're marching down the street. Um, and uh, for all the candidates, I'm wondering if you support disarming police and or abolishing police altogether, or do you support a more reform-minded approach that combines uh, considerations for both racial justice and public safety? And can you share your distinctions also between activism and policymaking? Thanks. Great, so Perry, since you were evoked in the caller's comments and also the incumbent, um, give you an opportunity to answer first. Sure, thank you. I'm gonna set my own timer too, so I don't go over time. Uh, yeah, thank you for calling in and asking this question. Um, there is a long history of folks being in elected office who have taken place in um, social, social movements um, in the course of, um, in our history, um, some that come to mind that I um, really admire. Um, Cori Bush, for example, was just um, elected to the House of Representatives, um, has stood with Black Lives Matter um, activists, um, Kamala, Kamala Harris, who's our vice president, um, you know, has stood with Black Lives Matter um, protests. Um, I, that chant in particular is not one that I particularly recall. Um, do I stand in solidarity with that movement? Absolutely. Um, and I feel like um, marching in the streets with folks um, is an example of that solidarity. Um, and just because I'm an elected official doesn't mean um, I'm going to renounce um, my solidarity with social movements, um, which also come, which often come from a place of disenfranchised power um, and looking to address um, address those those issues. Um, sorry, that's a there are many facets. So let me get to the other ones. Um, in terms of reform versus um, abolition, this is a question that's come up a lot lately because um, there are ways in which reform. Um, reform measures have um, come under criticism. Um, I think at this point, um, we're taking a multifaceted approach. The oversight policy on police discipline is a reform measure. I worked very, very hard on that. Um, there is no one who is in an abolition movement that would say that that was an abolitionist policy. Um, I think if you're talking about reducing firearms, um, I'm, I, this, is such a, this is such a long question, so I feel like I'm gonna go over. Um, reducing firearms or reducing the, side of the, the size of the department, um, I think those are more in the vein of, of abolition and I think do speak to a history and a tradition of looking at ways in which we can move beyond a community that it, it is where public safety moves beyond the need 
for police. I think we are we are having conversations about the need for a multi multifaceted approach. Um, that's I'm out of time. So thank you for the question. We'll try to circle back to this issue a bit later. Peggy Lewis, would you like to pick up the caller's question next? Sure. I did work with the police one for the ten years that I was in. Um, the city hall and and we managed to do some amazing things like get a woman into the police department who would check over all of the domestic violence responses from the Burlington Police Department and upgraded them. I, I will call for demilitarizing the police. I, I'm, I think the federal government sending all kinds of uh, military equipment to the police is something we don't need. And I would call for diversifying the police budget so that when we, so that there's part of the budget would go to more like social workers and other people who could handle people with mental, mental, um, illness problems and things like that, where there's been some really violent response from the police because they don't know, this is not a situation they know how to handle. I think the police need to be trained better so they don't take a militarized response. And I think it would be fine to diversify the budget um, so that other, so that part of it could go to a different kind of response team that's worked really well in some other cities. And I, I certainly think it could work in Burlington. And uh, I would, I would say that my experience with the Burlington police is, you know, there's a mixed bag. There were good police officer, and I, I think one of our main, uh, main uh, police problems is that when there is a, a, a bad apple, there the police tend to surround them rather than make them accountable. So I would. I would look for some community response on accountability in our police department. Great, thank you, Peggy. Tiki Rochambeau, we'll go to you next. We will actually ask if candidates could mute themselves as Perry brought up earlier, that would be great. We are getting a little bit of feedback on the line. Thank you. Oh, Y'all good, Seth? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, this is getting all the, the energy in the room, right? Uh, what I think is really important is that recognizing first and foremost, we have a lot of common ground in Burlington right now. I don't know that I've heard from anyone who does not agree with reform or accountability or racial justice. Uh, the, Burlington's unique in that sense. We don't face the same struggles that so many other cities are right now. And here we are divided and, and it kind of, it's confounding to me in a way that we could be so divided right now when we're all we all have such common ground. So I suppose the devil is in the details, right? Uh, I look at the timeline, for example, of this council, including uh, representative, uh, I'm sorry, Councilor Freeman, uh, in, in cutting the police budget last summer, 30% without a plan. Uh, that was concerning to me. Um, I, I wanna note that if we follow that timeline along, that only now, just now, an RFP went out to develop that plan. And then Monday night, the, the council dug in its heels and said, well, we know that the cap should be 74, for example. We can't tinker with that. There's not even a plan on the table. So I have to question, what's going on? It, you know, in some way, there's basic governance that has to be covered. And again, we're all open-minded, like, great, let's get this plan together. You know, let's get the consultants. I'm, I'm eager to hear what they have to say. You know, outside opinions are important, but you don't you don't slash and burn before you have that plan in place. What happens when you do that? Well, you create fear in a community. That's exactly what we have right now. Uh, we talk about uh, unintended consequences. You have the fire department submitted a memo to the council saying they will be unable to provide overnight services if the police do the same because they will not report to a lot of the calls without mm -hmm. police, makes sense. So we're starting to see a domino effect already. Uh, and, and I get it, you know, there's gonna be data cited that, oh, well, our overnight calls are low and there's nothing going on. Well, yeah, cause we're in a pandemic, right? <laughs> Everything's really pretty chill right now. Uh, but we're a town where uh, we, we have festivals, we have uh, a, a growing city population every fall with the university. Uh, just to, in summary, uh, again, I'm not averse to reform or ideas. I think even the police are into that. We got to set realistic expectations for the officers before we move forward here. So uh, that, that's my vision. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Point of information. Yes. What's the, what's the process for rebuttals? Is it just as requested or? 
We can provide up to 30 seconds for a rebuttal, yes. For any unlimited? Yes, yeah. That's fine. Well, we, we would stop e we would stop each of you after doing one. But yes, you can you can each take an additional 30 seconds if there's an issue with the other candidate's response, if you like. But we can only have one rebuttal or we can you, you can evoke it on each issue if you if you oh, so wow. choose. That's a lot. Um can I quickly just respond? Sure. Thank you. Um yeah, yeah I just I I there are issues in the language around the fact that like what the council did in June created fear or what is happening now has divided us when black and brown people in the city have been living in fear um, for a very long time because of data and statistics that show um, that the police department does not fairly and equitably um, treat those members of our community the same as white folks. So it, it's frustrating that now that we're moving, to me, now that we're moving forward, um, with changing things, people are saying, well, I don't feel safe and this is fearful and this is dividing us um, when that was already the case. Um, and we need public safety for everyone, um, not just folks who have um, the power to feel safe in the system that we already have. Thank you. Any further rebuttals? Yes, Tiki. Yeah, please, I'll try to make it short. So yeah, you know, no doubt, I, I understand our BIPOC community is negatively impacted. And so what we've done is we've traded their safety for the safety of women, for example, who are afraid to go out at night, especially when there's talk of cutting that third shift. So whose safety exactly is more important at this point? Is it, are we going to choose one community over another? I get it that, I mean, I mean, I think we can do both. I think we can protect both populations. They're both worth it. Uh, let's just have a plan. That's all I'm saying. I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much. We'll now turn back towards the call. And Aiden, I believe we have another caller on hold. Go ahead, caller. Yes, hi. Um, I would like to know how your background will inform your judgment on the council. And uh, if you could please explain uh, paying rent, child care, supporting family members, and struggling to obtain financial stability uh in that background thank you thank you caller peggy lures we'll start with you this time oh peggy i'm sorry you're you're muted i did not catch that question completely what was he asking i served family jobs but i knew he was i think the general sense was how is it, how would your lived experience influence your role as a policymaker, including uh, your personal history in oh, okay. terms of the work okay. you've done. Well, my lived in experience is that I have lived here since 1977 in the old North End, that um, I have been low income through most of that, even when I was the director of the council in City Hall. Uh, and um, I really feel like I know what people struggle with here. My other experience is 10 years in City Hall working on programs focused on women, um, you know, Vermont to this day, right now, I just learned that we are eighth in the nation in terms of the amount of women in the state who are killed by their partners. So that's, that's not a statistic we want to be proud of. And it seems like to some people, the whole issue of, of you know, what goes on for women is off the chart. So I'm always concerned for that. I'm concerned for, I also have um, graduate studies in ecological design. I'm very concerned about you know that there is a lot we can do in building to prepare for the future there are things that could be done to that city palace place whatever um you know it could it could be do we could be doing like the city of chicago does insisting that every new building of size has a green roof so those are the so i have experience as a carpenter so i feel like i'm a practical person a problem solver and an innovator the women's council did a lot of innovative programs we helped out we got housing for single moms we got the whole women in the trades thing rolling um we did forums every year we we way back then had a diversity film series to um to educate the community about some of the uh, racial justice issues here and I guess that's enough. Thank you, Peggy. Perry Freeman, we'll go to you next. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is a, um, an important question. Um, you know, I, I felt like I've uh, 
really been thinking about this a lot um, lately this last year, you know, for a while, um, I was, you know, probably the lowest earner on the council, which was something that I knew, um, you know, still a renter, um, but also this year um, have been a frontline worker, um, which has been um, pretty considerably impacting <laughs> my life um, and those um, that I work with. So um, I think in terms of you know, speaking towards economic issues around, you know, being a renter or making ends meet. I think things like low wages, um, you know, renting, um, you know, the rent being so high, um, those are things that um, I think I think about a lot. Um, and I try to bring that into um, the policy that I'm making, um, you know, on city council. Um, it directly influences that. I think, you know, going forward with the impact of COVID, um, on frontline workers, but not just on frontline workers, on families, um, on older folks, um, you know, on people of color. I think um, we really need to center folks who have been um, most dis, you know, disproportionately impacted. And I mean, ultimately all of us have been impacted, but also thinking you know, about folks who've been really um, severely impacted by this and how we're going to recover going forward and how we are going to be able to partner with state and federal agencies um, to make sure that that re relief and recovery is equitable. Um, and get to the people who've been hit the hardest. Um, you know, uh, I could uh, speak more towards, uh, um, you know, some other things. I, I was pretty, I went over time on the, on the last one. So maybe I'll keep this one a little bit brief, um, but uh, absolutely. I think that that's a really important thing. And I think it's important um, in this district um, to, to bring those, um, those experiences into policymaking because it impacts so many people um, in this district. Thank you, Perry. And now Tiki, we'll move to you. Yeah, thank you. Well, gosh, what a good question, right? Because we're all sort of an accumulation of our experiences through life. And I look back on my life, uh, originally born in Michigan, grew up in a rural area, and then my parents divorced. And the classic story, you know, the kid, the, the mom gets stuck with the kids and, and finds herself in poverty, right? And Peggy kind of spoke to that earlier. Uh, yeah, so that was my childhood is <laughs> bouncing around from apartment to apartment, finding a new school each year, uh, facing my share of bullies and try you know, the school of life, I suppose you could say, in, in coming up. I did, you know, I, I recognize I'm not in, a, in the same situation as those who are disadvantaged in their community, especially minorities, right? So I recognize my white maleness. Uh, gave me a leg up over others. At the same time, I did learn the value of work and, and a work ethic and that I consider myself a hard worker today. And, and I think that's important because there's so many lessons in that, that that come with, I guess, growing up in that, in that lifestyle uh, that, that, we, that I really hold on to today. So working hard is just key, right? Work, earn your dollars, and also live below your means, right? It, easier said than done, I get it. There, there's situations like high rents, you know, people paying 50% of their incomes, but it's still possible. Uh, honoring your word, uh, know your neighbor, and, and honoring the neighbor, you know, getting to know folks like that. So just lessons that like that have brought me to a place where I was able to scrape through, you know, menial jobs like dishwashing and cooking as a kid to now I'm overseeing a, a team of folks around the world, um, you know, uh, and building intelligence reports. So I, I consider myself blessed in that regard. And I'm just, uh, I feel just so fortunate in life to be where I am and recognize all that had to happen to bring me to this point. So it's an important lesson that I learned through growing up poor. Good timing. Great. Um, let's move back towards, there will be your election on the ballot. What other ballot items um, are, will voters see this year? What are some of the other six initiatives um, on the city ballot and um, what stands out to you and why? And can you quickly discuss, I know it's six items, but can you quickly discuss your positions on those ballot questions? Who's that for, Seth? Sorry about that. We'll start with you this time, Tiki. It's your turn <laughs> to start first. Yeah, sure. Okay. Wow. I'll go through them all. Uh, so I, I know ahead of time, just so everyone knows, you know, you would kind of run this idea by us, you know, like, is there one most important tough choice? Because a lot of consequential ballot items. I'm going to say my number one pick is the school budget. Uh, th that is our future, the schools. Without that, 
we don't have a solid foundation in our community. We don't have a future in Burlington. People will not move here without strong schools. And I just look at the Burlington High School situation and just feel like we as a community failed the students at Burlington High School. Uh, I feel awful that it, uh, both the teachers and the staff who work in the high school had to put up with the, uh, you know, the PCBs, perhaps unknowingly, and that they're effectively out of a place. Now, I'm so glad to see the Macy's temporary situation working out, but it, so I'm putting schools at the top. I know there's a lot of issues, but I have to mention that. Uh, I'm going to say a close number two for me would be the just cause issue. I, again, with this theme of this current council, I, I fear unintended consequences here. Rents will increase. Apartment conditions will deteriorate. These are the two leading items in this town that we don't want. It's already high rents and, and poor conditions in apartments. This is going to exacerbate that. How's it going to do it? Because it's going to force property owners to honor leases in perpetuity. So the renters who have a bad neighbor, for example, and when I say bad neighbor, what do I mean? The drug dealers living in the apartment next door, the sexual predators, as testified even in a subcommittee where Councillor Freeman was on, uh, these folks now are being protected by the just cause. And, and it's curious to me that this is never mentioned. All we hear is about unfair evictions where, uh, in fact, we have leases in place, we have courts in place. So um, I'm going to leave that aside for now. Uh, the other ballot items, my gosh, uh, loaded question. I don't know. I, I suspect we're going to talk about those in time. So let me just, I'll just stop there and say, yeah, thank you. Great. Councillor Freeman, you're up next. Thank you. Um, okay. So I think um, the, um, the most important one for me, at least that jumps out the most is the, um, is the just cause eviction uh, item, which is item number, oh, I'm going to miss say it. It's item number five. Um, and I think it's misleading to say that uh, rents will go up, that apartments will become uh, destitute. That's incorrect. It's not supported by evidence. Um, just cause eviction, um, it is essential protection for renters. Um, there was a bipartisan support from this on council. It passed nine to three. Um, uh, that um, you know created exemptions around some of the initial concerns, which were around you know what if I own a, a duplex, um, you know triplex, you know what what does that mean for me um, in terms of um, you know sexual predation and um, you know violent neighbors, um, you know no one supports those things. Um, it doesn't mean um, that we also don't protect renters through a policy like just cause eviction. Um, I think it's absolutely essential for this community. Um, I think a, a second, um, you know, pretty, pretty feels pretty strongly about is uh, ranked choice voting um, that I think will just bring um, sort of um, essential well-being to our governance. Um, it's, it's just a better voting practice. Um, it's one that I've um, supported and advocated for a long time. Um, and um, I will just go through the other ones um, as well, just to give a, a summary. The first one, of course, yes, um, on the school school budget. Um, uh, two on the airport commissioners, I will also be voting yes. Um, three on the regulating of thermal energy systems, I will be voting yes. Um, four, as I said, I'll be supporting yes. I'm actually yes for I think all of them. <laughs> Six is um, just cause evictions. Um, sorry, five is just cause evictions. Six is rent retail cannabis, which is a yes, and then um, on the advisory question around decarb um, decarbonization, I'm also a yes. So thank you. Perfectly time. Peggy Lurz, ballot questions. Yes, um, I'm going to say that the third one interests me a lot. The idea of that the city would do more to regulate um, thermal heating in, in, the, in the city, because as I've said, I'm quite concerned about what we can do with our built environment to prepare for what's coming that we seem to be pretending isn't coming. So I'm very in favor of that. I'm also um, think it would be only fair to for there to be someone from Winooski on the, the uh, airport commission, given the fact that Winooski is incredibly impacted by these F-35s. Um, I was one of the, in one of the earliest groups opposing the F-35s. I still do, even though they're here. I think they have, you know, destroyed a lot of livability for a lot of people. And um, I guess I support most of the ballot items. I'm um, trying to see here. Uh, I support the, uh, um, 
I wish our school budget um, went more to this, went a little bit less than, and then it does to administrative salaries. I keep seeing really high administrative salaries at the university and at the schools, and I'd like to see teachers rewarded more and uh, other programs. But um, so what are the problem? Uh, and on the cannabis one, yes, I support it. Although I would like to see, I would like, I don't think there's any reason to do advertising for cannabis. We don't need to push it. Um, but um, since it's legal, you know, um, and the rank choice, I support the rank choice. I think we did that for a little while and some people objected to, but I think it is a good system. And uh, the charter change, I'm not sure about the just cause because I think, you know, there, I've, I've seen both sides of it and it can be difficult. So I, I'm not really totally sure where I stand on that. I, I it doesn't, it seems like it's a little bit, um, we already have some pretty good ones. Okay. Thank you, Peggy. Next up, we're going to turn back to the caller line and uh, we welcome you, caller. Go ahead, caller. You're online with the candidates. Thanks very much for the opportunity to ask this question. Uh, Councilor Freeman's charter change voting proposal to create a police oversight review panel and bias and a biased police control panel failed this past January. The joint committee of the Public Safety Committee and Police Commission that Perry serves on was created last summer and charged with making recommendations on how to build a safe and healthy community. I asked Perry what are some of the recommendations this joint committee has offered to the city council to build a safe and healthy community since the committee was created seven and a half months ago. I'll ask Tiki and Peggy, what are your visions for safe and healthy community? Thanks very much. And caller, if you don't mind sharing your name and the town that you're from. I'm sorry, my name is Bob Kiernan. I'm in Ward 3. What was the other part of your question? You got it. Perfect. OK. So now we'll turn. Perry, you're up first, so you can go ahead and answer that question since it was also directed at you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was unfortunate that the um, oversight policy um, charter change was vetoed. Um, it did have um, seven votes at the council, but not enough to, um, to stand against a veto. Um, and that was unfortunate. I think that that was uh, the right move. Um, in terms of accountability, it was something that um, I had hoped to work on. Um, there was a lot of public support around it. Um, and I was really dismayed um, because I think that would have been a considerable um, uh, effort towards progress on this issue. Regar regarding the joint committee, I do serve on the joint committee. Um, there are 10 of us. It's the um, seven police commissioners and the three members of the public safety committee um, that has been meeting. Um, we have um, now one uh, uh, consultant that has been contracted through, um, you know, took, you know, just considerable amount of time for the RFPs and uh, these sort of things. Um, and they are now um, contracted with the city to do a community engagement project that was um, intentionally prioritized, um, sort of a little bit, um, you know, not, you know, much time in between them, but at least slightly before the um, audit. Um, which is now um, we are working towards um, finalizing the contract with that consultant um, and that audit. The first, um, some of the first results should be coming back um, by April. So um, the community engagement is meant to, um, contract is meant to, with that consultant is meant to also inform um, and help sort of um, do some of the work that the audit um, will also be doing. Um, I've, I've heard, you know, you're, this, the caller is not the first person to be frustrated about the timeline. Um, unfortunately, these things just, um, they just take time. Um, we are working on them. Um, and um, I anticipate uh, that, um, that there will be traction um, and, you know, recommendations uh, within the next several months, so. Thank you, Councillor Freeman. Peggy Lewis, we'll go to you next. Okay, so the question was in, to the rest of us in general about the community. Um, well, 
the issue of childcare is an interesting one because that has been a tremendous problem in this city forever and in this country forever. And it really is um, really makes life difficult for um, particularly single moms, but for all kinds of parents um, and you know single dads. Uh, we there needs to be there needs to be there was a proposal back when I was in City Hall for a small uh, tax to go to that and it. it I don't think, I guess they didn't actually, they proposed it, but they never actually ran it. I think that would not be a bad idea because there needs to be a lot more support. From what I have read, almost most of the jobs that have been lost during the lockdown have been women's jobs because though we claim that, you know, there's some equality, there really isn't, it really tends to fall to women to do the childcare. And there has never been enough in every other developed country in the world has child care and you know and 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 leave parental leave for both parents and we need to be catching up with that and that's always been a really tough issue in this neighborhood thank you peggy and tiki going back maybe to the caller's initial question as well yeah yeah thank you um want to just express my amazement and really why I'm here, right? A big motivator at, at Councilor Freeman's response to that, which is that there is no plan that cuts were made without a plan. We're just now RFP. This. Imagine what that is like to be in the community and to hear this, which is basically, trust me. Uh, you know, again, I don't think uh, Councilor Freeman is evil or anything like that. You know, I'm sure there is a lot of good intentions there, but trust me, doesn't work when you're cutting the police. This is a community that we've had for ages. Uh, you know, my neighbors who I talk to all the time now, I've been around for 20 years, I get to know a lot of people. And yeah, that's not okay with this community, this community that is the old North End and downtown. A lot of people have reflected on the old times, the, the way the old North End used to be and say, we don't wanna go back to that. We've seen so many improvements over the years. And I remember, you know, things have improved over the years too. I get it. There are people who have been marginalized. I say, let's fix it. So let, let's offer the more hopeful path here. What am I looking at? Let's revisit use of force. We as a community get to determine what that means. Do we, how do we, how do we visit this? So we need to set proper expectations for the officers because even they are saying, well, what do you expect of us? And, and it's unclear. Uh, we also need to review interdiction, which is honoring requests from other agencies. So a lot of times, you know, maybe it's another police agency says, hey, we had a lead that there's an arrest warrant out for someone in your town. Can you go arrest them? You know, so we need to take a look at that because that will reflect uh, on our own statistics about, um, you know, racial disparities. We need, if anyone who's been in this town for a long time might remember a guy named Justin Verrett, big teddy bear of a guy who was amazing at working with mental health care issues. He started with Spectrum, uh, my wife worked there for a time and then uh, went on to the police and helped divert a lot of the mental health calls from the police. And he was just a natural at it. We need a lot of Justin Verrett's in the police department. So I think this, this step, you know, the, uh, the Murad proposal, you know, was a step in that direction, but we do need to raise that cap. Uh, lastly, and I know I'm, I'm right up against it, but we need to honor the police commission and give them a direct role in department or mental oversight. I think what we had was a reinvention of something that already exists. And we can empower this current commission who has full of intelligent people to do this. And I, I'm sorry to go over. Thank you. Carrie Freeman, like a rebuttal. Thank you. Um, I think it's uh, inaccurate to say that there wasn't a plan. The plan was to reinvest resources um, into services that would better suit the community in terms of safety. That's what we want is safety and reduction of violence. Um, unfortunately, I think there's been a lot of fear mongering um, around this issue that has gotten us away from what actually keeps us safe. I also, you know, use of force is great to talk about, but when you don't have accountability measures like oversight and like reevaluating the union contract, which are not things that I've heard, um, you know, anyone else, um, you know, running for the seat talk about, um, those things are necessary. Um, and so we need real um, policy changes. Um, and that's what I, that's what I would like to do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other candidates rebuttals for 30 seconds? So seeing in the hearing none, we'll move back to the um, callers we have online. And I believe we have one or two more calls in about 10 minutes probably to go. So caller, we welcome you to the studio. And by the studio, I mean our homes. 
taking my call. If you can just be sure to state your name and what town you're from, we appreciate that. Yes, my name is Matt, I'm from Ward 2. This question is for Councillor Freeman. In April of last year, uh, one of the first COVID relief packages, uh, the CARES Act, brought $8.7 million to the Burlington Airport in free money. That guaranteed the operations of our airport and prevented about 50 families from being thrown into poverty. Yet you voted against that uh, $8.7 million grant. Can you explain your vote? And to our other two candidates, can you share how you would have voted on that uh, grant vote? Councillor Feeman, since your name was evoked, you can start and then we'll move to Tiki Archambeau and then Peggy Lures. Sure, yeah, thank you for bringing up this question. Um, I have spoken before about my concerns about the airport expansion. Um, it's not something that's very popular or discussed in Burlington, in Vermont, or even really in the US. Um, we have um, really a pretty much a culture of hyper-dependence around it. Um, I don't fly. Um, I, I have made a choice not to fly. Um, because it is, um, it is unfortunately, um, at this point, it just creates so much pollution. Um, I understand that there might be, at times, essential reasons to fly, but the majority of, um, of air, you know, air flight is, um, is for luxury, and it's also um, mostly done by people of higher means. Um, it's, not, it's not something that, um, you know, is really accessible even to lower um, or working class folks. Um, so I have, you know, stated publicly, um, you know, I don't, I don't have the appetite to expand the airport at this time. Um, my vote on that particular issue was around, around that and um, having consistency um, on that. I think that, um, you know, when I've talked about it with other counselors, um, I think, you know, ultimately it would be, it would be great to have a, a report about this. It was not included um, in the net zero energy um, analysis of our um, of our sort of greenhouse gas um, emissions and impact, um, but it is certainly something that impacts the amount of pollution that we have. I know these are difficult conversations, but when we're talking about moving towards a six mass extinction, um, so actually becoming extinct, um, you know, on a mass level of species, um, those are really hard conversations that we actually have to have um, because it's not worth extinction. Um, of, of, you know, and I, I, that just seems actually pretty obvious to me. So thank you for the question. I know it's a really difficult topic. Thank you. Thank you. Tiki Arshambo. Yeah, thank you. So I would, um, that's a layup to me. That's, it's easy. You take that money, right? Free money to address our airport. Uh, yeah. So that's my short answer. You heard it here. I guess none of us should fly um, because Councillor Freeman doesn't fly. So I will, I will contend that um, uh, it may be an image in some people's minds that, uh, that flying is for the wealthy. I, I recall vividly working for a Norwich University, my alma mater, earning $10,000 a year, uh, not a lot of salary. And they would send me to fly to recruit because I was in admissions at the time and they would send me down to um, you know, other states to, to go recruiting. So yeah, I, I can't say I was sitting in first class on that one, right? Um, <laughs> there's many reasons that people fly. We're a global economy. We rely on airplanes. They're just a, a part of what makes this, the, the world go around, so to speak, economically. Um, if no doubt climate change is an issue, so, so I get that. At the same time, if, if we're gonna be serious about it, then let's go all radical, right? Let's ban all cars from Burlington. Let's ban the planes. Let's ban all fossil fuels. Let's just go all in, right? I mean, to me, I, I just I think there should be more honesty in this than um, than what we're seeing at this point. Uh, the airport is, it serves a vital function for us in terms of travelers coming to and from Vermont. Tourism industry drives. It's a multi-billion-dollar revenue generator for the state. And yeah, you know, airplanes uh, are not ideal. I also know that there's a startup. Uh, here in Vermont uh, of looking to electrify airplanes. So, you know, there are strides being made. It's not like we're, it's right around the corner where we'll have electric airplanes, for example, but, uh, you know, we live in such a, an innovative community with an entrepreneurial spirit. It's that Vermont independence, you know, that smallness of us, of just striving out and, and making a go of it and, and using our, our intellectual resources for the betterment of everything. So 
we're doing the right things. I don't think it's the right thing to ban planes, and I think we should have taken that money. Thank you. Great, Peggy Lures. Okay, well, I I wish I knew more exactly what the money was for and who the fifty families that are losing jobs were. It, it would be, it would it might have an effect on my answer. In general, I am not for expanding airports. Um, I'm not for closing them down or saying no flying yet, but I, I do. I also agree that we are facing a tremendous climate change and flying is one of the most carbon heavy things you can do. So I don't, and I've watched the airport keep expanding and I watched the amount of cars sitting there keep expanding and we don't, we have to go to less cars, we have to go to less flying, we have to go to less of a lot of things that we've gotten very, very used to and that depend on carbon fuels and electricity doesn't solve that either. It, it helps, but it isn't, you know, we don't really have a solution. We really have to live on another, on a different scale and we're very unwilling to do that. Or maybe we're not so unwilling, we don't know because we're, I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're constantly propagandized by media that wants to sell us stuff. And, and um, so I would, the, the thing that would give me hesitation was a lot of people losing jobs, but I'm not really, you know, I, I, I would not be pro expanding our airport. It's expanded quite a bit since I've lived here and seen it. And it just brings more, more carbon and more cars in there too. And, you know, it's, I think, you know, when we've destroyed housing with the F-35s, which was a horrible decision on the part of our congressional delegation, every one of them stuck together to to little Patrick Leahy's ego project. Thank you, Peggy. We've got one more caller on the line. Um, so I'd like to shift to that caller, give it, each candidate about a minute, maybe 45 seconds to respond to the, count, to the caller, and then we'll try to give everybody a couple of seconds to wrap up tonight. So caller, we'll turn to you and welcome your question. And this question will start with you, Peggy. Okay, this is my wrap up question or? No, we're hoping for a caller is gonna pop on. We've got somebody on hold. Kevin from Ward 3. I just was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about how you would fight climate change, you know, touching on some other aspects of life, like, you know, heating in homes, bike lane policy and, uh, I think you covered the airport pretty well, but uh, but the other two, be interested to hear your thoughts on, on how you'd want to tackle climate change. No, it's tough, but if you could each keep your answers to one minute, we'll start with Peggy, go to Tiki, and then finish with Perry. Okay, well, I, my experience and, and my emphasis is on the built environment because I have been building passive solar uh, since I got to Vermont. Um, and so I, I feel like we can do a lot with that. We can do, there's a lot we can do uh, to mitigate the water, uh, the, the cleanliness of the lake uh, that we're not doing. And I think we really need to be focusing on these things. I don't know about eating at home. It might, uh, you know, there were, there were some innovative ideas by actually feminists like Charlotte Perkins Gill and where there would be a community um, uh, cafeteria and that, and I saw some of that go on in, in Holland and that's kind of nice. It's a, it's a social thing and it feeds people and, it, and feeding people in that way is, is more economical than each little house. So, um, so the built environment, a lot of it, get cutting back on fossil fuels. Um, you know, the, in the city, those are the things you can deal with. You can't deal with um, taking away the oil company subsidies. That's on the federal level, but um, okay. Great. We'll jump to Tiki. Yeah, thanks. Great question, right? Solve climate change in a few minutes. So uh, uh, this is one of those issues that it underlies the theme of my whole campaign, which is teamwork. I know that it sounds a little cliche, but what does that mean? Because climate change will not be tackled by Burlington alone. We have to adapt and, and grow partners in this relationship here and make that happen. It's not to be understated, right? Because we have to sell our ideas to the rest of the, the surrounding communities and perhaps beyond. Uh, you know, we're known as a progressive community and I think we can generate those great ideas. And I mentioned, you know, the uh, startup uh, looking at electrification of airplanes as an example. So uh, number one, you know, again, part of that teamwork example is, oh geez, we're at one minute, I guess. Uh, 
you break down a problem, you identify it, let's look at the biggest contributors to, uh, to global warming, and then try to look at a carrot versus a stick approach, right? Like there was initial penalty offered on homeowners who had efficient furnaces. I, I, that's a stick, and, and I don't think that's the way to go to sell this thing. Thank you. Great, we'll jump to Perry. Thank you. Yeah, this is why I love the, the Green New Deal um, structure. I think it's it's good to think of um, because of the last question um, regarding the airport, we talked about loss of jobs and we can't pit loss of jobs around a sustainable economy. And um, so, you know, moving towards um, jobs that are going to be good for workers and well-paying, but also um, are not jobs in um, sectors that um, produce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, I think will be essential. I think um, that also means expanding um, you know, walking and biking infrastructure. Um, you know, um, it also means um, expanding public transit, making that as um, affordable as possible. You know, we've had free transit during COVID. You know, that that's something that I've supported. How can we continue to see that so that it's not an economic issue? Um, these climate solutions. Um, you know, there's the weatherization policies. I think are very good. We're looking at district energy um, from McNeil. Um, so, you know, what I have some questions about the biomass aspect, but you know, how can that mitigate? Um, in terms of the built environment. Um, I think those are some of the ways that we can move forward. And I, I understand that there's a desire around entrepreneurial spirit, but um, I think we really need to be bold um, going forward. Great, so unfortunately we've got to wrap up tonight's, um, tonight's forum on a quick note. And we really appreciate you all joining us. Obviously Burlingtonians have a difficult decision to make and are uh, grateful for your willingness to serve. So thank you candidates and thanks for abiding by our rules today. Sorry we didn't get the closing statements but know you'll have opportunities to commute with the, the, uh, the public outside of this. And again, this is brought to you today by Town Meeting Television. We encourage you to continue to tune in for forums, stay engaged and remember March 2nd to get out and vote or come up with a voting plan early and make sure you engage with your town clerk and uh, make sure, get that ballot as soon as you can in a safe way. Thank you for joining us this evening. This has been and brought to you by Town Meeting TV. Thank you candidates.